All right, good evening, everyone. We're glad to have you with us again as we continue our Bible study in the Gospel of John. As you notice, um, probably there's a little bit of a scenery change today. I'm not at the church building in my office as usual. I am in my dining room. Uh, some of you may remember last December during our um, holiday parties, a truck came through our parking lot and um, snagged the telephone line and ripped it off of the building. Well, this time we had a truck come through and tore our power line down off of the building. So the church building is currently without power. Um, we are expecting that to be fixed hopefully by tomorrow or Thursday at the latest. So I have kicked the family out of the dining room and told them all to be quiet. So hopefully we can get our half hour Bible study in here uh, today. Jen and Sean are out on the front porch doing school in this uh, beautiful weather that we're having right now. So we're going to continue out in John chapter 18. We're going to pick up where we left off. Jesus is uh, talking with Pilate, and Pilate is trying to ascertain what it is that Jesus has done. And you might remember that he asked, uh, he told the Jews to, um, you know, take him and try him according to your law, and, and they weren't uh, interested in doing that. They said, you know, if he's not a, if he wasn't an evildoer, we wouldn't have brought him to you. So Pilate is trying to find out by talking to Jesus what exactly it is that Jesus has done that has upset the people so much. And um, we looked at Jesus' statement in verse 36 last week. We spent a lot of time when he talked about his kingdom not being of this world and pointed out that his kingdom is not of this world. It's in the world, but it's a spiritual kingdom, not an earthly kingdom. And, um, and his kingdom is the church. And then um, we're going to pick up in verse 37 here in John chapter 18. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that the world should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you want therefore do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Okay, so going on here, let me adjusting my computer a little bit. Okay, moving on now. I said last week as we concluded that we would talk about Pilate's statement, what is truth. Um, Pilate's response to Jesus when he talks about truth is a, a rather common um, attitude that many have toward truth uh, in today's society as well. And that is, uh, you know, a lot of people hold to the idea that truth is um, subjective, if you will. And um, there is no such thing as definite absolute truth. And we um, have dealt with this in lessons before, so we're not going to go into too much detail. But um, Pilate's statement, well, what is truth? It, it, it doesn't seem that he was really asking that, desiring an answer from Jesus. Uh, in my mind, I sort of just have him saying this and sort of walking away in disgust He's just making a statement, well, what is truth? He probably believed as well, you know, that there there is no such thing as truth, or maybe that truth is just so difficult to come by and to identify that there might as well not be uh, anything like uh, real, hardcore, hard facts in life that one can adhere to. Well, Pilate doesn't allow Jesus really to answer the question, but we do know that Jesus has told us what the truth is. He's made that known. It's not a secret. We, we read back um, in John chapter 17 when we were reading his prayer uh, to the Father. Remember at that point he said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And you sent me into the world, and I also have sent them into the world. And so he says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So what is truth? Well, God's word is truth very easily very plain psalm 119 and, and 160 the psalmist says the entirety of your word is truth and every one of your righteous judgments 
endures forever. That's one of the good things about real and objective truth is, is that, you know, it, it doesn't change. It's not slippery. It's not just subject to man's interpretation, but it's real truth. Another way to look at it in regards to, you know, what is the truth is to realize that, well, Jesus himself is truth. Uh, you look, for example, at John 14 and 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What does it mean, though, when Jesus says that he is the truth? Well, is full of truth. Um, for example, in John chapter 1 and verse 14, we have the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus was full of grace and truth. So when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he's saying I'm full of grace and I'm full of truth. And then we also remember a statement a few verses after that in chapter 1 and 17. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Not that there was no grace or truth in Moses, but grace and truth came to a fuller and more complete extent through Jesus. And so what is the truth? Well, God's word is truth. You know, man's, man's truth sometimes is found to be wrong or in error, but not so with God. If he reveals something to us, we can trust that it's right and it's true and it always will be true. Jesus is the full embodiment of God's truth. And that truth is absolute. It's objective. Um, we can know it. We can believe it. And we can obey it. Some people, again, look at all the religious division in the world and come to the conclusion that, well, it must be too hard for man to understand because we can't seem to come to any type of agreement or accord on what the truth is. But the scriptures uh, are knowable. And the problem comes when we start putting our own interpretations, our, our own spin on that truth, and causing uh, religious division. Um, this truth is absolute because it's the Bible is absolute truth because it was from God. It's not from man. It's not from the mind of man. It came through man, but it is from the mind of God. No prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So, the, the truth of God's word is just as true today as it was when it was given all of those years ago, thousands of years ago. It, it's never going to be out of date or irrelevant or obsolete. It is still true today. It has no need of being updated or upgraded like we have to do so often with our technology. Uh, it's always going to be the truth. Remember the words of Peter having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abide forever, because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. So Peter's saying at the time that he wrote this, that, you know, the word of the Lord endures forever. And he says, that's the word that we've preached to you. And I'm we're saying today that that is still the truth. Um, we are still being taught and able to know the gospel of Christ that was given all those years ago. You know, unfortunately, there are so many uh, in the world who look for justification to disobey what the Bible teaches, to not believe. And one of the excuses that they sometimes use is that, well, you know, we don't know that what we have is really God's word. Uh, it could have been changed or altered uh, through the years. We just don't really know. People that make that statement have never really looked at the facts, never really studied the topic. Because, again, not going to go into a lot of details in this short Bible class, but we know when we've studied it that um, there is ample proof that what we have is what was written originally. And it is still valid. It is still true today. It has not grown old or obsolete, obsolete um, in any way. 
So God has given us the truth, and it's possible for us then to know that truth. Um, again, Calvinistic doctrine is the, has in it the idea that man some t- somehow has to be enlightened uh, by the Holy Spirit before he's able to understand and know the truth. And that comes from the Calvinistic doctrine of hereditary depravity, meaning they believe that we've inherited the sin of Adam and that, you know, we were, we're depraved in our souls and God has to enlighten us and cleanse us in some way before we can actually know the truth and understand it. Again, that's not taught in the scriptures. Uh, Jesus promised his followers in uh, John 8, 31 and 32. He said to those who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So we can know the truth. Why would God go through the trouble of giving us the scriptures, um, inspiring mankind to write his will, but then allowing, but then allow those same scriptures to be corrupted over time? Um, that doesn't make sense. It also doesn't make sense that God would go to the trouble of revealing his word and then give us a word that we can't understand, that we can't know, that we can't agree upon. We can't. We can can read the Bible. We can understand it. I'm not saying that um, we're going to have 100% understanding of every little thing that is said in the scriptures because I I know that there are some prophecies in, in the book of Revelation and prophecies in other places in the Old Testament that are, are difficult. And anyone who tells you, I know exactly what that means, uh, watch out for that person because um, some of those prophecies are very difficult. But, you know, it's not difficult to know God's will. It's not difficult to know uh, who God is and what he expects from us in terms of how we're to behave and how we're to believe and, and practice the truth. We can know God's truth. If God is unable to give us an understandable word um, that we can know, then, you know, what kind of God is he if he can't communicate with his own creation? So, yes, we can know the truth. It's knowable. Does it take some work? Yes. Does it take some dedication? Yeah. Sometimes might we want some help? Sure. Um, But we can know God's will. God's word tells us also that, you know, the Holy Spirit, he convicts us through the truth or with the truth. You know, you think back to uh, on Pentecost when Peter had preached the gospel to uh, the folks of uh, his day on the day of Pentecost. It says in Acts 2 in verse 37, uh, when they heard this, well, what did they hear? They heard the gospel. They heard the truth being taught. Now, when they heard it, they were cut to the heart. Did they understand the message that Peter was giving? Yes, they certainly did understand the message. And that message cut their heart. It, it, it wounded them to understand that they were guilty of sin, guilty of crucifying the Son of God. And so um, as a result, then they were convicted of their sins and they wanted to know what they had to do in order to be saved. You look in Acts chapter 11. This is... Um, In Acts chapter 10, Peter had been sent to the household of of Cornelius, and he began to preach the gospel to them. And uh, when Peter then in Acts chapter 11 is telling the Jews what had happened when he went to the household of Cornelius, uh, in Acts 11, in verses 13 and 14, um, Peter is saying, he told us how, Cornelius, he's saying, has told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. Notice again, Peter was going to come and deliver words to the household of Cornelius, whereby they would be saved. What words was he giving? He he was giving them the truth, the word of God, the gospel, that they might be saved. Same goes with um, over in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip opened his mouth and began at that scripture and preached Jesus to him. He preached Jesus. So if the truth is unknowable or if it's subjective or slippery and difficult to know, really there's not even salvation available to us. 
we can know that Jesus is the Son of God. Not just hope or wish that Jesus was the Son of God, but we can know that he is, and therefore uh, obey the truth and have salvation. So not only then is it possible to know, it's possible to obey that truth. He wouldn't command us to do something that we were unable to do for some, some reason. We're going to be held accountable to that word. Matthew 7 and verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. We can know the will of the Father, and we're going to be held accountable to the will of the Father. Uh, when this life is over, we're going to be judged according to truth. And so, again, that truth must be available, must be knowable, or God would not be just and righteous in judging us with that truth. You go down to verse 24. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And so we're to hear his sayings and obey his sayings in order to have uh, salvation. We're to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So um, the fact that God demands obedience to that word, it means that the truth is knowable and the truth is doable. We can obey it and be pleasing to God. So uh, again, that Pilate says, what is truth? And, and really, that is a statement often made by people who really don't care what the truth is. They've not taken the time to try to learn the truth. Um, but in a spiritual sense, Jesus is the truth. God's word is the truth. And Jesus embodies all of that truth. Well, um, Pilate again tells the people that he finds no fault in Jesus. Um, you know, in some ways, Pilate is, that is commendable. Um, he's not just immediately sending Jesus off to be executed because the people want him to. He's trying to uphold justice a little bit here. He's saying, oh, I don't understand why he deserves to die. Uh, of course, you know, he could have done more, and we're going to see that he doesn't. He washes his hands, literally, of the whole situation. But um, he's trying to appease the people and quell the unrest um, but at the same time, he's trying to not put an innocent man to death. Now, it was around this point in Jesus's um, trials, if you want to call them that, that Pilate realized that Jesus actually was from Galilee. And as a result, he thought maybe he could push this responsibility off on Herod and let Herod deal with this issue. You look over in Luke 23, beginning at verse 4. It says, Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no fault in this man. But they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. And it says, When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt, mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became, Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been at enmity with each other. Okay, so Pilate hears the people say, beginning at Galilee, and he says, is he a Galilean? I can almost, I can see a smile on his face. He's thinking, ah, here's my out. I'm not going to have to make a judgment on this man. And so he learns that Jesus is a Galilean, and that was then not part of Pilate's jurisdiction. That belonged to Herod, another governor. But this Herod evidently was in Jerusalem at this time for, for some business, and um, he decides to send Jesus over to Herod. Now, it's interesting what we read here, that Herod had heard about Jesus, 
And he had desired to meet Jesus uh, for a long time because he was hoping to see some miracle done by Jesus. You see, Jesus' uh, reputation had gone gone ahead, so to speak, and Herod had knew about him and heard of the miracles that Jesus had done, and he wanted to see some of these miracles. In my mind, um, Pilate sort of, I think, saw Jesus as a magician or something, you know, just uh, a performer. Uh, and as I say that, I, it, it occurs to me that, you know, there are a lot of people who view religion in that way, that it's there for our entertainment, there for our amusement in some way. You know, that's why so many churches or whatnot have, have gone down the entertainment highway, so to speak, and and they try to make their worship entertaining so that, you know, people will continue to come and they just continually try to entertain people to bring in the numbers. And I'm not saying that Christians shouldn't have fun and enjoy themselves together, but certainly our worship of God is not about entertainment. It's not meant uh, to be pleasing to, to us, though it should be. Um, it's meant to be pleasing to God. But anyway, uh, Herod is, is happy to see Jesus. He hopes to see some miracle. And we read that um, he, verse 9, he questioned him with many words, but then Jesus answered him nothing. Remember what Proverbs says, answer a, cool, a fool according to his folly. And then sometimes it says, do not answer a fool according to his folly. As I've said, the difficult thing is sometimes knowing which is which. But at this point, Jesus didn't respond to Herod. Um, Herod wasn't really seeking truth. Um, he was wanting to see a miracle, and Jesus, he wasn't going to indulge his curiosity. He, it, he's on his course. He knows what's going to happen, and Jesus is just, he's enduring until his life's about to end. So he doesn't indulge Herod, even though Herod's a, a leader. Had Jesus, that's something to think about, had Jesus maybe done a miracle to to show to Herod, it's quite possible that Herod might have hauled off the whole thing, the whole trial and execution. Um, so um, Jesus doesn't answer because answering may have thwarted what God wanted to happen. And Jesus knew that he had to go to the cross. So um, we're told then that Herod with his men of war treated him with contempt, mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, sent him back to Pilate. So um, Herod is not able to get anything out of Jesus. Jesus is unwilling to indulge him, and uh, he sends him back to Pilate. And then, you know, as a side note, verse 12, we read that Pilate and Herod sort of became allies or friends at this point, and before they had been um, enemies with one another. Okay, so uh, going back then also, back we're back into John chapter 18. We also read there uh, in our passage that about Barabbas uh, being released. Um, this seems to me to be, it's another, another means that Pilate tried to use to um, be able to let Jesus go. He says, you know, we have a custom that I release a prisoner to you at the Passover. That's something that the Roman governors had started doing in order to help relations with the people was during the Passover, they could request to have someone let out of prison, and they would. And so he offers to let Jesus out, and um, the people ask for Barabbas. Now, our passage uh, here in John describes Barabbas as a robber, as a thief, um, but if you look over in Mark 15, I believe it's verse 7, um, there he is also described as one who was guilty of murder and rebellion. Okay, so he was, that first of all, that's not a contradiction. He could be guilty of all three things, robbery, murder, and rebellion. So needless to say, uh, Barabbas deserved uh, to be in prison. Um, he had done wrong, deserved the punishment that he was getting, uh, but Jesus did not. But the people decide that they would rather have Bar Barabbas, so they choose Barabbas over Jesus. And, you know, it's it's interesting to think about kind of 
applying that, you know, the people chose Barabbas over Jesus. Do we sometimes choose something ahead of Jesus? Um, do we choose our friends to go ahead of Jesus? In other words, do we allow our friends to um, convince us or lead us to do wrong and disobey Jesus? When we do, in a sense, we're saying, I choose my friends over Jesus. Um, what about money? Um, there are some who choose money over Jesus, and money is more important to them than their relationship with God. And so they spend all of their time working and never spend any of their time in study of God's word or in worship of God. So again, they're they're choosing they're choosing worldly riches over spiritual riches. And so really anything that we choose over Jesus is some way, in some ways, we're being like the Jews who chose Barabbas. We're choosing something or someone else over Jesus. Okay, so we um, finished up chapter 18. We're just going to start uh, chapter 19 real quick. In John chapter 19, uh oh, took the wrong thing. There we go. In John chapter 19, we read, So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Um, in regard to uh, the scourging of Jesus, um, first of all, scourging was something that was um, sort of a requirement before a person was going to be um, crucified. They, had, they were scourged before they were crucified. And again, the scriptures just tell us Pilate had Jesus scourged. It doesn't give us any details or explain to us what that entailed. But we know from historical record that, you know, the scourging of Jesus was terrible. And many, many people often died from scourging. Um, by Roman, the Roman way of doing things, um, there were only three classes of individuals who could skip this scourging before crucifixion. Uh, Roman senators, soldiers, or women. Now, soldiers were exempted unless they were guilty of desertion. If they were guilty of desertion, then yes, they had to be scourged. But women and senators did not have to endure scourging before crucifixion. Wasn't that nice of them? Um, but the scourging was... Um, done with a, a flagellum, a whip, and uh, this would be a short whip with several braided ends, and um, in these braided thongs, there would be things like uh, iron balls or sharp uh, pieces of glass or pottery. There would be sometimes animal bones tied in these uh, leather straps at various lengths along this whip. And um, the one who was going to be scourged was, was stripped of clothing and um, tied to a pole basically with his hands stretched out his back. And the person was flagged by uh, either two soldiers who took turns. They were, these soldiers were called lictors. Or if there were, was only one soldier to do it, he would do it, but he would, he would whip from one side and then switch sides and whip him from the other side. So uh, there were, this scourging was done by one or two soldiers. And the severity of the scourging often depended on who was doing it. Um, you get a soldier that some were much more cruel than others. Uh, you might have one that had had a bad day. And maybe he was mad at his, his, his leader for some reason and wanted to take it out on you. Then, then you got it a little bit worse than, than the others. Um, the, the purpose of the scourging was to prepare them for the crucifixion, and, and their job was to get the person on death's doorstep, so to speak, but they did not want him to die before he was actually crucified. So they became very good and very skilled at bringing a person to the doorstep of death, so to speak. These iron balls and these things that, that hit the person would sometimes cause deep contusions, the pieces of bone would cut the skin. The pieces of pottery would, would, would cut the skin. Um, the longer the flogging or the scourging continued, the 
those pieces would begin to cut into muscle. And um, when a person was finished being scourged, um, it was not uncommon for their, their whole back all the way down, you know, to their thighs and buttocks to just be a quivering mess of blood and muscle. Um, pain and, and blood loss often left the victim in shock. And again, sometimes it was fatal. Sometimes these blood clots would would pass through the heart and, and kill the person. It, that sometimes happened. So this is what um, Jesus was enduring here when we read that Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Doesn't give us any details, but this was horrible. And it really set the groundwork for um, the rest of the crucifixion um, when he's carrying his cross to the place of crucifixion, when he's on the cross, he has these wounds on his back. And those wounds um, make it so much worse because not only is he dealing with hanging there on the cross and the nails in his hands and feet and the difficulty breathing, but he has the terrible, terrible pain um, from the scourging that he has just endured. Okay. It's been about a half hour now, so we're going to wrap this up. Um, we're going to pick up here in John chapter 19. Again, we just sort of got started, so we'll start in John chapter 19 next time. Uh, thank you for watching. Hopefully every, the video worked out okay. I saw earlier, it looked like there might have been some glitching. I don't um, thank you for watching, and uh, hopefully there won't be too many more of these. We'll be meeting again on Wednesday. Have a blessed week, and again, if there's anything you need, let us know, and we'll be glad to help. Take care.